Hi folks, Kevin here. Well, today I'm going to talk about the 12 permaculture principles. Uh, the permaculture principles were brought forth and introduced, uh, I believe it was in 1978 in Permaculture One by um, Bill Molson and David Holgram. And David Holgram uh, consolidated the permaculture principles down to 12. Other people have done other work. I know Toby Hemingway has made um, has contributed a lot by recategorizing or uh, representing the permaculture principles. And I'm sure there's lots of ways that these can be looked at. I really like the way that David Holgram put these together. And on this image here on the, uh, on the screen, uh, it shows the, the 12 permaculture principles sort of like the, the, the numbers on a clock. And then in the center of it, we have the earth care, people care, and fair share of return of surplus. And they make up sort of like the, the axle, the center hub of a wheel or a clock. And imagine spokes going out to each one of these uh, permaculture principles. And a wheel really needs each one of those spokes to be intact and, and, to, be, and to be relevant in order for that wheel not to become wobbly and become defective. So I think that looking at each one of these permaculture principles as being an absolutely necessary and integral part of a design process, whether you're designing a community center, uh, a business plan, uh, a social or, uh, community center, uh, a demonstration site, or your own little homestead. Whatever it is, it's taking these uh, permaculture principles, utilizing them as a checklist or a, um, a resource for analyzing, are we considering all of the things that we can extract from the system? So we're all, you know, we're, we only have so much time in our lives and so much energy. And permaculture really helps us to manage our time manage our energy flows. And so we want to have that energy flow, whether it's solar energy, we want to capture it all along the, its potential sources on site. And I'll get into that uh, during this discussion, <clears throat> my review of the permaculture principles. So let's get started. Observe and interact is the first permaculture principle. We want to take into account from our sector analysis and looking at those forces that come on to our our properties or our sites that we're going to be working at, and and take take a, a, a list, make a create a list and detailed list of all of these factors that are coming into the system. So certainly the climate, where we are in the world, the topography, the landform, the shapes, the hills, the the slope, the water axis, the ponds, the streams, the wells, the wetlands the uh, winds, the f potential fire risks, the neighboring uh, systems, how everything is going to affect us on site, the road access, the trails on the site, trees, forests, woodlots, what's there? The structures, the buildings, the ruins, the soil, the vegetation that's existing on the site, the habitat, the wildlife, the mammals, the birds, the reptiles, the amphibians, the fish, the microbes, everything that's there. We want to gather as much information as possible. We want to go to the uh, town's historical records and see what is there, what's, what's happened there in the past. We want to take into account uh, the, the annual and monthly rainfall, precipitation, uh, temperatures, extremes, the hundred year events, all of those things are part of the observation and interaction. We want to gather all the data as possible. What's the solar angle? What's the solar exposure? Uh, are the winds horrific on site? Uh, is the slope too steep for what we want? We have to realize all of these things and we're going to have to go back and revisit over and over again. Now about permaculture uh, principles number two, capture and store energy. So first we have to expand our idea of what energy is. You know, there's potential energy sources, like water stored high uh, in ponds on the site, have the potential energy. They don't have the biologic diversity, but they have lots of potential energy. We don't have to spend money to irrigate our crops or to take care of our household needs. The woodlots, lumber, firewood, nutrients, 
all of those are energy sources on site. Biomass, the wood chips, the compost, the trash, the cardboard, all energy sources. Gardens, they feed us solar energy, just like in the previous ones I mentioned. These are all uh, energy resources that we can use over and over again, and they're all the result of capturing solar and water energies. Our orchards, our food forests, the solar energy, the photovoltaic, the solar thermal, uh, the solar hot water, uh, wind energy, um, pumping water, uh, uh, electrical energy generated from uh, wind, certainly geothermal in some locations. Obtaining a yield, the third permaculture principle. How, what are we going to get out of our efforts? Well, we have to be really creative and utilize the feedback systems on site and, and replenish those systems. Keep the, the flow of energy going on the property, not letting any of the energies flow off site if at all possible. Yields can be food, fuel, fiber, medicine, uh, building materials. Beautiful views and experiences are a great uh, yield as well. Certainly financial rewards or uh, social rewards and cultural rewards, forms of capital. All of these I'll discuss in, in, in other topics in the future. Our kitchen, er, uh, kitchen uh, vegetables and, and uh, herb gardens are both uh, great forms of yield. They feed us. Our vegetable gardens, our market gardens, well, we can trade, we can barter, we can, we can get uh, financial capital from the market gardeners, uh, gardens. Our food forests are fruit, nuts, and berries, foraging and wild crafting, inoculating uh, mycelium uh, for mushrooms into the cardboard, wood chips, into our logs that came from our woodlots, utilizing the lumber co that comes from our woodlots, using, using lies, excuse me, trying to rush here, trying to uh, use woodlots for our firewood. Uh, Certainly we can, we can harvest uh, our seedlings and we can take our rootstock that comes from uh, extension of our berry plants and sell those as nursery stock as well or tr barter for other things that we need. If we've got hives, we can, we can uh, get a yield of honey and wax. Apply self-regulation and accept feedback, the fourth permaculture principle. Accept our failures and try to learn from them, analyze them go back to them. Don't feel bad about the failures. Failures are actually good for us. Living simply is, is stopping our reliance on other systems, reducing our consumption, uh, decreasing uh, our reliance on distant systems. We know that food often comes to, to our grocery stores from uh, the other coast. Well, I'm on the East Coast, so food can come from quite a distance. If we can reduce our reliance on these systems, we're winning the game. Decrease our dependence on fossil fuels, decrease our emissions, our fuels, burning brush, burning our trash, burning wood. If we can uh, have more energy efficient homes or, or uh, utilize thermal mass units, we can decrease our emissions through, the, through utilizing these other resources. The fifth permaculture principle, Use and value renewable resources and services. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to go over three different categories of investments here really briefly. So regenerative investments. So those are the ones I think of, most people think in financial terms, so I'll say compounded interest rates. So if you start early in life when you're 15, 16 years old and you put a $100 a month into, uh, into the, the market, well, you may retire, you know, stop contributing when you're 30 years old and die much wealthier than someone who started when they're 30 years old and contributed until their 70s. So that time, the compounded interest is something that, that, that reflects what regenerative investments are. So what are some of the regenerative investments? Well, certainly uh, if we put, put, money in, uh, re put our time and energies into perennial crops, uh, the resources can increase re with use. Uh, the resources are lost when not being used. So, you know, the apples from the apple tree, if we don't uh, use them for our pies or for our ciders, well, then they're lost to us. Well, not necessarily. They go into the soil. They can be composted. So it's, again, a, a way of re redirecting these, these outputs from our systems. Some re uh, resources 
are, are not even affected if they aren't being utilized. So uh, generative investments, those are like the piggy bank. It's, there's no compounded interest. So I think our vegetable garden is a good example of a generative investment. The resources are lost by use. So in other words, you put the time and energy into uh, creating a vegetable garden, you utilize that, and, and if you don't let it go to seed, self-seed, and you're not using perennials, you're just using annuals, well then you've got to repeat the process over again next year. But you got the, the, the benefits of that investment. It's just a short-term gain, and it's uh, dollar for dollar, if you will. And it certainly can be greater than that, but that's my example I'm using. A degenerative investment, those are the ones like the car that you buy. They gradually break down, their value decreases as soon as it goes off the lot, and it's a source of pollution. And, and uh, the more that you use it, the more degradation that there is with it as well, especially if you're not maintaining it as well. So biological systems that use solar energy increase the, the resources on, on site. Uh, they produce energy, they, they build soil, they assist in yields, they interact with other elements on site. Uh, here's an example, so horseradish, Jerusalem artichokes, uh, fruits and nut trees and berry bushes. So we have some, all these, these are all perennials, and so we can go out and harvest the horseradish, we can harvest the Jerusalem artichokes, and as long as we don't take too much, they're going to come back year after year after year. We can use them and plant other places, barter with them, and use them over and over again a really good example of a regenerative system. A side note is you want to be careful where you put those on your site. You don't want to just be jump to the, uh, to the techniques right off the bat of implementing a design element unless you're cons considering uh, this is a good place for something that's going to be permanent there because once you put in some of these plants, the Jerusalem artichokes and heart horseradishes, you're really going to have to work hard to keep them from coming back. Sustainable woodlot management, fertigation systems. So we want to use like our uh, runoff from areas where we're doing composting loaded with nutrients going to flow into the systems. Well, put our, our feed our orchards and our food forests with those systems or our gardens. Food forests are a great source of energy, that's solar energy, wind and solar energy, thermal mass, a huge beautiful battery that we can keep putting energy into and keep uh, getting, it's a, it's a regenerative investment, if you will. So we want to recycle energy, capture that flow of energy as many times as possible as it flows through our various systems on site. The sixth per permaculture principle, produce no waste. Waste and pollution are resources. We're, we're just ignorant of their value and how we can use them. So we really have to study and look at systems to know that all waste, even our human, human waste, is something like John Todd has, has developed the living machine model that many people are using. Uh, my system, the bio, bioremediation system I've got on site, doesn't do nearly as well as that, but it's certainly, we can design systems, especially in larger systems, that really don't produce any waste. Unused resources, the inputs and outputs are pollution if we, unless we think about what's coming out of the system, where can we direct that into? What comes next in our design system? Service and maintain equipment. So as I mentioned before, that degenerative investment like the tractors that I have, my truck, my dump trailer, these are degenerative investments. However, with appropriate service and maintain, maintenance, I can keep them going as long as possible and reduce the chances and the, the amount of pollution they're putting into the environment. So we want to reduce, reuse, repair, repurpose, recycle in order to produce less waste. We want to reuse gray water whenever possible. We want to capture our rainwater. We want to use bioremediation as we can. We want to compost as many different ways as possible from our little worm beds to our composting piles to our heat generating thermophilic composting. Sheet mulching, not producing waste, not letting the paper products and cardboard go out, out into the world. We can use the cardboards as well for our mushroom inoculation. Design from patterns to detail. I have a talk that I've yet to do about this. It's a huge talk, just like this one's getting, so I'll move on. 
uh, appropriate integration of pattern designs to enhance the natural elements and features of that pattern. The design should block or deflect those unwanted sector forces that are coming onto our site, the fire risks, the high winds, the, uh, the frost zones because of the uh, microclimates that are created on our site. They're designed to capture the desirable forces and, and, and that are coming onto our site. They're, they're to maximize the edge effects. Uh, the, the edge effect is the most beneficial effect uh, in our design systems. Easy access to the features is important when we're integrating these design patterns. Each element should provide multiple function and each function should be met by the uh, production of various elements. So we want one system to feed multiple systems and multiple uh, resources to meet the needs of any one element. Okay, integrate rather than segregate. Very important concept, not just with people culturally and socially, but also with our uh, plant species. So an example would be uh, during uh, planting of fruit and nut trees on your site and creating a fo food forest or whatever, or an orchard. We want to integrate uh, both early and late succession species. So those early succession species take off and grow like a bat out of heck, and they can be cropped and chopped along the way, chopped and dropped and create mulch and, and build soil at the same time that we're waiting for the other species to grow. Another thing we can uh, do is we can plant guilds, supportive species that help that tree make it, uh, uh, optimally reach its, its potential at an appropriate early enough time. Now, one thing I'll mention is that uh, integration isn't taken strongly enough. So our almonds, which I'm a big almond consumer, are produced in the West Coast, and uh, they're monocultures. And as a result, they, had, they, they bring in bees, and over the last couple of years, they had to bring in bees from out of the country, hives from out of the country, to meet the pollination requirements. And so that's a terrible pitfall of the um, not appropriately integrating and segregating species, having a monoculture. So having a diverse species crop around there and having various other uh, uh, nectar and pollen producing plants would circumvent that problem. They'd have all of the, the, uh, the nutrients that are available to enhance the development of the uh, almonds without, uh, and they reduce their pest load as well. And it'd be enough to keep the pollinators in the area so that they wouldn't have to bring in pollinators. So certainly we want to integrate whenever we can and, and avoid segregation. Uh, as the system matures, if we've, if we've uh, put in uh, these early succession plants, we chop them, create the mulch, build soil, as I mentioned. We want to maximize the relationship between each of the elements uh, on site. So uh, with the plants, the trees that are there, we may want to integrate, well, have a, have a nectarine tree, then followed by an apple tree, then a nitrogen fixer, uh, a, a legume tree there uh, and then follow that with a pear tree and then a, a plum tree after that and then another nitrogen fixer and followed by another nectarine tree then followed by an apple tree so having the integration and uh, mix of the various species potentially reduces the, the the chance of the insects taking over or disease being more of an issue it, it, it creates more resilience in our system and it builds community, especially when we're using, uh, you know, you know, intercropping or using early succession species or building guilds. Use small and slow solutions whenever possible. This is one of my greatest cha challenges. So start small. Begin just outside your door. Start with a small uh, herb spiral potentially, or a small herb or vegetable garden. Uh, and and explore. Geez, what's your? Uh, how well is it doing? How's the uh, slope of the property where you've got this on? How are you able to meet the water needs? Um, are you getting enough sun to the to the to the plants that you're growing? Start start with small test garden beds. The orientation, the weed control, the location, the ease of access, irrigation as well. 
Uh, build on success and learn from your failures. Share your experiences with others. Uh, inoculate uh, mycelium from mushrooms into some of the, the, the logs that you take out of your wood lots and into the wood chips and the cardboard piles that you have. Start small, see if this works. Woodlot management, you want to go into this slowly when you're, you want to learn the appropriate way of harvesting and certainly when you're doing pruning of your fruit and nut trees. I've certainly made many mistakes in the past and have learned from them, been quite eyesore over time uh, when I pruned inappropriately. So when we're managing our woody species, going about it and starting small, gradual learning. Actually, now instead of doing as much pruning, I'm doing more training to get more uh, production out of the plants, out of the trees in the orchard and, and uh, food forest. So use and value diversity, the 10th permaculture principle, very, very important. Diverse annual crops. So let's say you, you, you love your Irish potatoes. Well, maybe you might want to also plant some uh, sweet potatoes and maybe do some uh, anthocyanin producing blue type of uh, the, the standard white potatoes, your Irish potato type. Maybe you're going to uh, include some uh, Jerusalem artichokes so that they're there as your starch crop. Uh, the diversity of perennial crops, so having different berries. We have blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, uh, black currants, red currants, uh, pink currants. We have uh, um, service berries uh, so, and honey berries. So having diversity in your, in your crop species, if the birds come in and take out all of the berries on one type and you didn't get to it in time, or you have a, a, a late frost, whatever it may be, having the diversity assures you that you're going to have some yield that you can still do your canning and freezing of, of your uh, berry crops or your perennial crops. Utilize different composting techniques. We do vermicomposting, we do the thermophilic aerobic uh, composting, we do some uh, woody mulch uh, composting for heat as well. Having redundant power supplies, having a, let's say, a, a, a uninterrupted power supply for your computer system so you don't lose the data that you've been working with. Uh, having a battery backup or a generator system when the power goes out. Having water, redundant water supplies, so we have a couple of wells on site. We have different uh, tank systems that we keep water in. We have a reverse osmosis water system that's on our third floor that's gravity feed that we can use as well when the power's out or the water uh, line is broken. And I can use that while I take the time to repair it. Having different pond and swale and canal systems, especially during drought times so that you've got redundancy so you can irrigate those crops that, that you've worked so hard to keep going. Uh, conserve diverse uh, native species habitats whenever possible and create habitats for display species and species of special concern. Both of those last two uh, topics are things that we take very seriously and we worked hard at for years on our demonstration site. Use edges and value the margins. These are the, the dynamic zones. It's the interaction between two different elements, let's say a woodlot and a meadow or uh, a pasture zone. So that margin, that transition zone between those two areas has, is the most diverse and has the greatest number of organisms. It not only has the organisms from the, uh, the species from the woodlot, it has the species from the, uh, from the pasture or from the meadow, but it also has a unique set of species right there in that marginal zone. So you get the benefit of all three there really great in accumulation of resources and nutrients on site. Uh, it optimizes the edge, uh, uh, always optimize the edges on your site as much as possible. And this integrates with the uh, using patterns in the design of your system. And uh, all of these, these resources that are in these marginal zones, we just have to look at them a little bit differently because they can be so beneficial. And we can put specific crops in there that can be used by those species, those bird species, so they don't predatorize as many of the berries and nuts that we want to keep for us. Utilizing farmscaping, and that's another entire talk, 
but it's basically incorporating uh, various perennial plants and her herbaceous plants that can invite in all of the beneficial insects, all of the beneficial predators of the, of the negative, of the, of the uh, what we call the bad bugs in our gardens. It creates habitat, it creates nectar and pollen for the bees, it creates a diverse uh, environment for various uh, toads to, to, to uh, snakes to birds to all of the different insects so it's a really wonderful way of, of designing a system it can deflect some of the, the the winds it can manage microclimates as well so our marginal zones in our ponds are equally as important and we use those for bioremediation in our system and it's a, and it's nutrient accumulation as well so creatively and use and respond to change, the, the 12th permaculture principle. This one we need to keep coming back. Here's a couple of examples. I experienced tremendous sediment buildup in the canals and ponds that I, that I put in. So I ended up my way of uh, responding to this, to this significant uh, change is I put in an additional canal system that I can capture all that sediment in and harvest it more easily. We had uh, some of our uh, raised beds were hugel type, type uh, hugel culture type uh, raised beds, and the amount of consolidation, com comp compression, compaction, uh, reduction in the height of these woody beds really was remarkable over several years, requiring more input in and a, and a redesign on my part as a result of it. Even though they were heaping tall, when when I first put those systems in. Uh, deer eating the young tree and berry produ uh, bushes on site. That would break my heart every year that the, 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 they would start shooting up and doing much better and the deer would come, down, come through and eat them down. So what I ended up doing was purchasing some adjustable tree guards even for the bushes and that ended up really solving the problem quite well. So now we've got a deer antler rubbing the fruit and nut trees. So that's a, a big issue and it kills a, quite a few trees when it goes circumferentially around the, the, the trunk of the tree or rips off some of the, some of the limbs or, or only damages some of the, the bark on the tree re resulting in the opportunity for opportunistic fungal infections to take over. So turn problems into solution. It's how we look at them. Uh, restrictions, restrictions can shut us down or, or drive creativity, supercharge us. And that goes from a political or uh, neighborhood issues that might make you think, geez, there's no way I can accomplish this. Or it could be the pest that's on site, like the white-tailed deer that I talked about. Or it could be people worried about mosquitoes on site with their pond systems. These drive our creativity and help us find the appropriate solutions to these problems. You know, mistakes are tools. It's what we learn from them that we find most valuable because that tool we can apply to other systems. It doesn't have to be the exact same problem again. So this took quite some time. So th there are some other really well-known ecological designers and I'm just gonna name drop them right here because I think they're really good people to get um, uh, get some ideas and incentives, incentives from. So uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Jean Novell, William McDonough, uh, Ken Yang, Glenn Murcutt, uh, Ranzo Piano, <laughs> Rolf Disch, Buckminster Fuller, and John Todd. Uh, and I'll have all of this information. So this uh, web link here is where I got the icons for, for the uh, presentation, permacultureprinciples.com, really good website. So again, just in conclusion, uh, I really believe that um, David Holgram did a really good uh, design system using this clock face or using this, this wheel with the spokes coming out uh, uh, emanating from the axle, the, the, the three ethics of permaculture, earth care, people care, and return of surplus or a uh, fair share. Uh, we need to keep revisiting these topics of the permaculture principles to enhance and improve our design and share those, uh, those, uh, the, the lessons that we've learned with others along the way. So I'm sorry this took so long. Uh, please, if this was of value to you, please give me a thumbs up. 
leave comments, uh, leave suggestions, thoughts that you have about the presentation, what you'd like to see in the future. I have a few more permaculture topics I'm going to try to uh, get out pretty soon. Share this with your friends and family, and by all means, have a wonderful day. 